Alright guys, welcome back to another episode of the Coffee Bean of Life because this is all I have time to record nowadays. But anyway, jokes aside, today we are back with Samyuk and Jing Hao and Justinian and today we have one more special guest, so would you like to introduce yourself first? Because no one here knows who you are. <laughs> Hello, I'm Jovan. Uh, I was invited to this podcast on the grounds that I'm an artist who does very interesting things. Yes. Um, so I consider myself like a very amateur writer. Uh, some of you may have seen my short film or documentary. I am a very, very amateur filmmaker. And um, yeah, at the side, outside of school, I also do like, I'm part of this um, playwriting collective that's um, composed of a bunch of different Singaporeans from different backgrounds. And basically what we do is we write plays and we are planning to maybe arrange a public reading of these plays um, early next year. So yeah, that's about it for me and thank you for having me here. Thank you for coming. Uh, maybe let's start with the short film that you mentioned. Um, tell us more about like this film, like what is it about? Um, okay, so uh, if my memory is quite hazy, but if I'm not wrong, it's called The Day After. <laughs> and the main concept of it was, the main premise was that I, I filmed the entire thing on 10th August, which is the day after National Day. So uh, just to give a bit of context, at the time, this was a film stock project. So I'm part of Film Society as well. And we were basically all assigned to make our own documentaries on whatever we wanted to. And at the time, I think it was also the GE period as well. And I got like really, really into Singapore politics. So I decided, oh, I want to do something related to politics and uh, something about Singapore, I guess. So the stars aligned, and I spontaneously decided to um, just make it like sort of sort of a big project. So I gathered a few friends, and then we just went around Singapore and uh, asked random people on the street like this one question. If I'm not wrong, it was uh, what do you want from Singapore, and the idea was heavily inspired by this other documentary that uh, my film instructor showed us. It's a Polish documentary called Talking Hits. And basically, it's also a kind of similar where they go around asking people uh, different questions. And I think that question in Talking Hits was, um, what do you expect from life? If I'm not wrong. And yeah, I was really inspired by that to just um, extract just these little uh, bits of people from their responses to these questions. And through my own documentary, I was trying to just paint a picture of um, what Singaporeans really wanted from the country, from the government. And it was, I kind of wondered it serve as social commentary, uh, but I'm not sure if I really achieved that goal. That sounds uh, very cool. Samyak, do you, say, you want to say something? Um, actually, Jovan, my favorite part from the, the short film was uh, during the first minute where, the, uh, where you have this footage of a sign saying, beware you're being watched by, uh, I think, like one of the citizens' committees, which I think was actually effective social commentary as you intended to do. But um, when you were like interviewing people for this, right, did you ever encounter people being like, oh, I don't want to say anything, I'm too scared that I could get into trouble or this kind of fear that many people have when like commenting about Singapore in general? Uh, okay, firstly, thank you for the compliment. Uh, secondly, regarding that fear that you mentioned, it is a very real thing. Uh, if I'm not wrong, we managed to get 20 people uh, interviewed in that one day and for the entire documentary. But that was after we traveled to like six MRT stations and we spent like an entire day trying to interview people. And I think um, out of every MRT station, we only managed to get like around a third of the people who we asked for interviews to actually agree to an interview. So um, that fear is, of course, a very real thing. And uh, I think it's also been just caused by um, all this, a, a bit of blind nationalism as well uh, to, to the state. And of course, uh, all our social studies materials that, that promote this narrative of Singapore being like perfect as it is and not needing any change at all. So there's a lot of government apparatus that helps to ensure that this is the status quo. Cool. I do want to ask, um, 
like do you have a, a favorite response like from the people you interviewed like was there someone you found like particularly interesting or their response was quite surprising to you mm. okay, i need some time to think because it's been a while since i made that <laughs> actually you were gonna cut this no uh, thinking no, on the show okay, I'll, I'll just add in something else inside in, anyway so like we, later we if you guys are confused about all the short filmers uh joey can just give me the link and i'll include it in the des- description of this podcast yeah yeah so you guys want to check it out? I'll be sure to like watch the video while Joan continues thinking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But like, well, Joan continues thinking with response. I'll just start talking a bit about the creative process in general, I guess. So, like, what would you guys define what the creative process is? Like, as? Ooh. Like, what would you think? What would you define it as? Who? Who? What, me? Or yeah, what? anyone. Justinian can speak since he hasn't said anything today. True, he has yeah. not said anything. Yeah. Um, I think. No, I don't know though. I'm very uncreative. Um, <laughs> is it a process? Is it, is a, it process? a process? That's a really good question, right? I actually used to write poetry when I was wow. in, like... Oh, I do remember, yeah. Um, in year three. I kind of stopped because I, I guess like this creativity can kind of like step away. But I think like when you read about like people like T.S. Eliot and like Ezra Pound and all these like um, poets by the 20th century, I think one realizes that like contrary to the common perception of creativity as being as coming like burst right where like everything is really like well i've got an idea i'm gonna write it right away actually you see that um these poets didn't write like that i mean they obviously had inspiration but they just keep revising their things so the creative process is not wizardry i think um as one like might commonly think it is but it's actually something that takes a lot of hard work like even in the most kind of spontaneous of me, uh, media right like poetry uh, I, I think you see that like a lot of the time what seems like free flow um very often is the result of a lot of like train processes and like um yeah and like work and it's the same thing right it, and like music um because like i love music right so anyway um as we know <laughs> yeah so Ravel, who's this like french composer right he had this like piano concerto um, and then there was this, this is like really flowing melody that's like really simple, like kind of like a nursery rhyme kind of thing. And then there was this friend of his who kind of asked him, like, how did you write this? Right? It's so simple. And then he said, like, it almost killed me trying to write this melody. He spent like a month on it. <laughs> I think that really encapsulates, I think, a lot of what the creative process is. It's more of like creative tedium than like a creative process. Yeah. Okay, that was an amazing explanation by Justinian. Uh, so now we'll be going back to Joan since he's our uh, uh, main uh, spotlight for today. So, uh, uh, what was your favorite like response? The response. Yeah, Jing Hao asked. Okay, so um, something just came up to mind, which was uh, at East Coast Park, there was this uh, lady whom we interviewed. And I think she mentioned something about um, how in Singapore, the different races tend to clump together in their own um, racial enclaves and I think that really stood out to me um, because I've also read in this other book, I think it was uh, Air Conditioned Nation by Cherian George where he mentions that um, in Singapore, we don't live, we don't really live in like a racially harmonious country but more of one where differences in race are tolerated and I think that's just been uh, exacerbated by the fact that the government treats race as something that's um, a safety hazard where during let's say racial harmony day we are constantly reminded of the, the racial riots or the, the very possibility of an outbreak of uh, just violence between races or the differences between races being manifesting into something much worse so I think um, I think just based on their response alone it's extremely powerful in showing us that there's a lot done when it comes to uh, addressing diversity uh, between races in Singapore. Well, wait, what exactly did she say though? <laughs> right, so, uh, yeah, she said like, the, I, I'll quote her word for word, like, like, she said that she notices that uh, in a lot of, in, in Singapore, the Chinese tend to group with the Chinese, the Malays tend to group with the Malays, the Indians tend to group with the Indians, and so on, right? So, uh, different people from different racial groups tend to stick their own racial enclaves rather than actually 
uh, mingling with those of other races, which of course is a bit of a generalization, uh, but I think it's true in some aspects as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I feel like you can like see this like unique feature of Singapore being like a factor of the type of media you see being created. Like, I remember there was this like issue with one of the Our Boys to Men films about how like one of the actors felt that they're being like racially profiled when they had to like speak in an accent. So it's like that sort of thing. I guess it's it's going to be an issue. That's that's probably why you see like like so much like safety being placed around like the type of media you create. Because I think our position is unique in the sense that we live in like a quite a big multicultural society and if you look at like current affairs and stuff, you're, you're going to see a lot of uh, tensions when it comes to race in other countries. Like Black Lives Matter has been a hot topic for who knows how long this year. <laughs> yeah. Uh, shall we... Where are we going from here? I'm kind of wondering, right? Um, just got a question. Like, you know, when you made this film, you had like kind of intentions to do some, some sort of social commentary. Um, but I'm wondering if you think like should all art in general, does all art have a duty to have some kind of political involvement or element? Because I think that's a question like artists always ask themselves, whether art should be political. Do you think, what do you think? Mm, when it comes to art, there is always something that's, I mean, art that can, um, art that appeals to the masses. I think there's always something that's political about it. So I was actually in a theatre course with uh, Mr. James Cole, if you know him, last mm-hmm. year. And he basically mentioned that, um, okay, so that was in the, the sector of theatre, but I think it applies to art in general as well. So there's a spectrum where at two extreme ends, there's the aesthetic and on the other end, there's the political. And all art falls somewhere on that spectrum. La. And the thing is that um, for art that is too political, it can be argued that it's considered propaganda, whereas for art that is too aesthetic, it can be considered as um, having a lack of tension. And I think that tension is actually very important, and that's why politics is also something that's inherent that inherently makes a piece of art uh, more powerful and enduring as well, because tension is what drives art, and tension is really what drives theatre as well. The tension between uh, the different characters as they work their way through the, the story, or in poetry as well, we talk about tensions a lot, tensions in themes such as um, fate versus uh, self-determination. So it's this tension in art that keeps us um, wanting to find out more about the human condition, and in doing so, also discovering something about ourselves as well. And I think that's what makes art beautiful, besides the aesthetic aspect of it. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering yeah. if you think that like the aesthetic and the politic must necessarily be um, like polar ends of a spectrum though. Can, 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 can something not be very aesthetic and yet very political at the same time? <laughs> I'm not really an expert in the field, so I can't really comment on yeah. that. Well, what do you think? What do you think? <laughs> like, um, yeah. So what, what do you mean by if something is extremely aesthetic and extremely political? So how would that look like in an art form? Well, I mean, this is pretty cool, right? Because like, if we think about like really political, like you were talking about propaganda, right? Like I think the first thing a lot of people might think of is like socialist realism in Russia, um, the USSR, mm-hmm. that kind of like really political thing. But like in literature, for example, there's very political literature, right? Um, yeah like um audience stuff right very political but it can also be very aesthetic why why do you think we might have this tendency to polarize like what is aesthetic and what is political is it because there really exists polarity or is there something else at play i mean you usually Mm -hmm. sacrifice some kind of like something in the art for like you that means your art is kind of subordinate to a higher goal right if you if you turn like I like I'm look well right now like when you ask the question I thought of, um you know the saying art art for art's sake mm-hmm. you know, where mm-hmm. um you know art the idea that art has uh, value in of itself you know and it's and what it says here I'm just gonna read it for you it says art for art's sake affirm that art was valuable as art in itself that artistic pursuits are their own justification and art doesn't need a moral justification right like there's a lot of art that's created uh 
just for the fun of it or just because something looks nice it doesn't always need to serve some kind of a higher purpose and usually when it like i guess it depends you know like people draw inspiration like joven drew inspiration from politics for why he creates but that's not to say that all art must always necessarily serve that purpose yeah on that note since joven has given us a really good seg point into i would like to talk about your theater work and uh, can you tell us more about you know what you do with uh, this the playwrights collective? Uh, okay, so for playwrights, the the playwright collective that I'm in, uh, it's called Playwrights Commune. So what we do right now is that we have weekly meetings every Sunday, and at each of these weekly meetings, we try to um, write at least say five pages of a script to present it. So um, at, during the meetings themselves, we uh, go around the table and we do like a live reading of each other's scripts. So for example, we assign person A to play this character and person B to play that character. And we believe that the live reading itself, I think at the very least helps playwrights to get a sense of whether their dialogue flows and whether their dialogue is organic. And after the live reading, we then do this uh, three-step process that's, uh, that was started by this other member in my uh, collective, Theo. So Theo proposed this idea of this three-step process where at first we ask clarifying questions. So um, let's say we, we ask questions like, oh, why is this headed this way? Or why is this person doing that? In order to get a better idea of the direction of the play. And the second step is to say what we liked about the play. I guess this appeals to the ego a bit. Uh, and of course, saying what we like also helps to highlight what the, the playwright should continue doing. And the third thing is we then try to uh, suggest changes or improvements for the play that we just read. So um, it's this process that allows us to, uh, like, like Justinian said about the creative process, to continuously refine and polish our plays uh, as we go on with these readings and just come up with um, better, more, um, polished place in general. So how many people are there right now in the uh, playwrights or what, commune? Collective. Yes, I don't know what <laughs> I just change words like halfway through. Like, right? <laughs> how, how many people are there? Right now there's about six people. Six so people. I'm the youngest person there. I'm, yeah, I'm the youngest person wow. there. And uh, I think the next youngest person is 19 years old. And there's a few people who are like, 20 something, 40 something. So yeah. how did you how did you come to be, you know, involved with this group of people? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so interesting story. During the circuit breaker period, so the necessary stage uh, on Instagram, they posted like this uh, playwriting workshop that they were going to hold over Zoom. And at the time, I was like, nothing to do. Ma. So I decided to sign up for that workshop. And I got in. Then we went through with the workshop and at the end of it, um, a bunch of people in the workshop were actually interested in starting this playwriting collective so that we could um, help to chart each other's growth and also help each other in the writing process. And that's how we managed to come into this um, playwrights yeah. community. Um, Jovan, you know, uh, I think theatre in Singapore can be kind of insular sometimes, right? Because often it's the same audience watching the same place. So it's like preaching to the converted sometimes. So is outreach something you all think about while writing your play, plays to make it more accessible to like a larger group of people? Mm. I mean, at the, when it comes to writing plays, the best piece of advice I've been given fundamentally is to write what? want to see and personally um my process isn't really driven by what i feel should be in the theater industry right now um of course some people may have that kind of process but uh, personally not for me like, i write what i find interesting and yeah that's about it so maybe i'm walking on the street and i see like this really interesting scuffle between two people then i might develop that into a play and yeah i just write um basically whatever I think is cool. Yeah. How do you start writing plays though? Because I think for most Singaporean people, most don't even like read plays, let alone like write them. So how did you get to watch them? 
<laughs> yeah. I, yeah. You I mean, don't want it's a problem, yeah. Hmm. Um, when it comes to writing plays, or I, I think writing anything in general, um, prose and poetry as well, yeah. it's yeah. always good to read. Um, read a good piece of work from um, Alfian Saad, for example. That's what really got me into playwriting in the first place. Um, read because you then have a model to base or whatever you want to write your play, whatever structure you can uh, consider writing your play on. And after that, once you have a rough idea of what a play looks like, uh, you can start by developing your characters. So in a play, what really drives the plot of a play is what do the characters want? What are the characters' desires? And it's the clash in these desires that drives, well, the drama and the conflict in the play. So once you develop, once you have developed your characters and their wants, then I think you can start um, doing out a skeleton for what's going to roughly happen in each and every scene. And from there, it's quite an organic process. Huh? So once you have a skeleton, then you can start writing the scene and you can dress up that skeleton with a muscle and skin and whatever. Mm -hmm. So the writing of the dialogue itself, um, I think if you're not living under a rock and you've heard enough conversation, it will come quite naturally to you. Lah. And for monologues, uh, monologues, the thing about monologues is that they can be quite po poetic. They tend to explore a more spiritual uh, a side of the characters. So if you want to write better monologues, uh, I think reading poetry is a really good exercise as well in order to work that creative muscle and in order to, think, in order to uh, more efficiently think of metaphors that you can use in your monologues. But yeah. Who are some of your like influences? Because you mentioned Alfin Do you have other like influences? I'm wondering. Um, so when it comes to writing plays, I've mainly been influenced by Haresh Sharma and Alfin Saad. So um, during the circuit breaker period, I was just like binge reading Alfin Saad's plays. Uh, and then I got the idea for, to write a play myself. And uh, Haresh Sharma is a pretty huge influence as well. Uh, I watched his most famous play off center, I think in year three, but I didn't really think much of it uh, until then, until this year. Uh, I've also been reading uh, his play collections, like a trilogy which has Gamut Girls and Fundamentally Happy. And I think yeah, those are really a great plays that I, everyone should check out as well. And yeah, I'm still trying to um, find my way through a Singaporean theatre. Tell us about the... Um, um, I, well, I don't know how much you know about the state of Singaporean, but like, tell us like, what you know, like, what do you think of um, the theatre scene in Singapore? Which, I mean, oh, from my impression, like, I mean, we do have like uh, facilities, right? Like the Esplanade and everything, but it's not to say that there was uh, uh, like a terrifically strong sort of industry in Singapore. And especially like considering, you know, the history of, I guess, the, the historical emphasis on say science and tech and math in Singaporean education, as opposed to, uh, the art. So, I mean, like, tell us what you know and what you think about um, the theatre scene in Singapore, maybe. Um, I think when it comes to theatre, take this with a pinch of salt, because I don't really know uh, that much, but there's very inherent high barriers to entry when it comes to theatre, uh, both in terms of being the audience, because tickets are pretty expensive, and the only real place I've watched like in the flesh are uh, because of school programs where tickets are subsidized. And uh, I think in terms of entering the theater industry as a new artist, the barriers to entry are quite high as well. Um, because I think that in Singapore, the theater, the, the bigger theater companies with more influence, they are afraid to take risks with newer, more inexperienced directors or playwrights or whatnot. Uh, so they tend to recycle like more mainstream plays up and uh, just reuse like, the same directors over and over again. And I, I guess I don't blame them because there is always a profit motive when it comes to any industry. 
and actors, um, writers, stage crew have to be paid up. And it's really hard to take risks when, um, if let's say a play isn't really that good when it's the directed by uh, someone who's new to the industry and, and it just crashes and falls and they don't get paid or they make a loss. So yeah, that's just, I think one of the issues with Singaporean theatre nowadays. And another issue is that they, is that because um, I think a lot of funding comes from the government as well, the National Arts Council who gives grants to uh, theatre companies to, to stage productions and etc. So of course, um, when it comes to dealing with the government and, and getting uh, financial grants, they also don't want to stage works that may be um, inflammatory or undermine the government's legitimacy. So there's also a kind of fear when it comes to taking risks in that sector as well. Yeah. Um, I remember reading in Air Conditioned Nation, right, that when they wanted to build the Esplanade and Georgia really wanted to build that, a lot of the cabinet ministers or the MPs were actually against it because they didn't see the, the value of having this kind of arts place uh, in Singapore. So since the early 2000s, when they've been making this push for accepting more art, do you think amongst like our own batch or like the attempt to get more people into art, do you think it is succeeding? Do you, or do you think it is still very surface level? Mm, I think at this point of time, um, mainstream art tends to be surface level. Uh, I'm not very sure about the exact uh, situation, but I read in this article by Suzanne Chu that that basically said that um, since the late 1980s, I think one of the main goals of encouraging a more holistic education that centers around arts in Singapore as well has a more um, economic objective mm. in that because it encourages uh, critical and creative thinking, it also helps to um, nurture more entrepreneurs, uh, uh, helps to bring more ideas in research and development. So the problem is that if you hinge the development of the arts on this economic goal, right, it's not very effective in actually developing the arts. Um, firstly, because we don't actually derive the true value of the arts from doing this. Uh, the, the arts is uh, a medium for us to learn more about the human condition, to, to construct um, our own interpretations of the human condition and I, I guess just to become more empathetic, more uh, compassionate people in general. So if we just think in terms of um, just economic efficiency or uh, these kind of uh, one-sided economic goals, right, then I don't think that we can truly accept or truly derive the true value of art um, from uh, from its implementation in, in let's say, education. Mm. And actually, yeah. like, German talking about economics uh, reminded me of something. I remember reading this, like, uh, it was on Reddit, so, like, I don't know about its factual accuracy yet, so I should probably check this before. I remember, like, reading about how, like, you know, Keynesian economics, right, one of the famous economists that came up with that, he was talking about how he thought that because of capitalism making everyone super rich, right, we would see a future where people would be working 15 hours a week and then spending the rest of the time on creative pursuits. To like find out more about what it means to be human, etc., etc. So like that obviously turned out to be a big lie because work hours have only been increasing, if not stagnating, while wages have basically not changed in terms of real wages. So like, I think that it's like the thing is that in order to pursue something like the arts, right, you would have to like inc you would have to give people the resources and the space to allow them to do it. So like, given the in this place like Singapore, where like the work culture is quite difficult. Like Singaporeans tend to have like very long working hours and all that. It's very hard to like ask them to like invest more time into artistic pursuits. I guess I guess you could say, and that's part of the issue I guess in Singapore. Like, especially like even if you want to say like oh you can just do a career in arts right, you do all the issue like who's gonna pay for that? Like, like the, like if you look just look at like graduate wages on like NUS like the website from NUS right like. If I, like immediately at just face value, like it just seems like getting a degree in STEM is already more, is already better for you from like every aspect. So why would you do that? So like, how do you guys think like, you can ultimately get more people in the artistic industry if you can't find 
economic value within it. I think the problem is that we premise everything on economic value because obviously there is value and merit to economic value, right? But I think um, what Jovan and Samia kind of pointed out is that the problem in Singapore is that um, because everything is so premised on economic value, the arts, which by nature are unfortunately less economic, uh, which is not which traditionally was not always the case, uh, but currently is the case, right? Um, suffers, and I think the problem is like okay if. To answer the question, right, if you really want to encourage people, um, the first thing is that you really have to change the basic foundations on which we, like, build our value systems. Um, not value systems in terms of, like, personal values, but in the sense of how we value things. Because I think we have not, I think, as a society, really learned to value art, as Singhao said, for art's sake. There's, I think difficulty for a lot of people in doing that because there is no environment no kind of cultural tradition in singapore that has this kind of artistic sense permeating it um i think it's a big problem so one thing that needs to happen is that an environment be created which is very difficult uh, because environments don't like you cannot like create an artistic environment you know you can only provide the seeds for it but like one has to do that like you cannot just try to tell people to be artists and then hope that they will just become artists. Like in all of the great like artistic circles of the world, right? Like um Weimar Germany, for example, where there was a lot of creativity going on, or um yeah, a lot of European traditions, or even in China where you had like um during those like the Tang Dynasty, a lot of poetry. All these happened because there was kind of a how to say, a kind of fertility in terms of the entire culture that allowed for all of these like um cultural and artistic ideas to spring forth <laughs> stop laughing at all but thank you so interesting choice of words that's all continue yeah. <laughs> so i think it, it's very difficult like, i think you can say you know these are the necessary conditions you know we are going to have to need an environment the very difficult part is how we're going to create an environment in a place that has traditionally never really prioritize this sort of environment. It's not something that you can do through policy. It's not, like it's something that's just gonna take a very long time, I think. Yeah. Yeah, Samia, go ahead. I mean I agree with Justinian, but I think it would be an uh an oversimplification to say that it has never existed. I think rather the lack of an artistic environment is a deliberate consequence of the deep the depolitization that has existed. Mm. post independence right so i think there was an environment True. and in fact a lot of artists helped in the anti colonial movement to get singapore independence and stuff like that right but i think um returning to more contemporary times the national arts council has attempted to provide like an economic basis for the arts to proliferate and to get more people interested in it but obviously as jovan mentioned the funding that the national arts council provides is very tied to the government's intentions mm. and the government's aims of what it sees as valuable art and things that won't like um um harm their concepts of social unity so i think if we really want to provide an economic basis for the arts we would need to move to a model with an independent arts council that can judge i mean i don't like the word judge because you can't really judge the value of art but to come up with some kind of model to value art and see its merit for art, for its art sake, and see the value that it provides to society. Mm, honestly, yeah. right? Like, if you look at, like, uh, okay, I'm going to move, like, the discussion towards, like, the, like, growing, like, social media, like, the growing presence of art on social media platforms and, like, creativity in general. So, like, like this, like, the presence of the internet is, like, a double-edged sword in this aspect. Because in one hand, it promotes creativity. <laughs> As it most. Yeah, yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah basically, it doesn't. Like, this, like, on one hand, you see, Favorite, like, like, Singapore yeah. artists or YouTuber or musicians, like, being able to, like, put the work on a global platform, which really gives them the economic capacity to expand in one aspect and just get more recognition for the work. But now on the other hand, right, you see, like, more people viewing, like, me international media. So, like, in such a culture, it's very hard to get people to spend more on local media as well. Like, if you can just have a Netflix sus subscription for, like, $15 a month, why would you go and spend $85 on one theater ticket? Like it's very hard to like get people to justify spending on the arts in Singapore locally. Like how like how like what what like what percentage of your monthly budget is supporting local artists? Like for most people, that would be close to zero dollars. 
So like, yeah. how yeah. do you get and people to spend more? You know, that's like one of the bigger concerns. Yeah, I do agree. Like, I mean, I think, like when you say that art doesn't have any economic value, that's not exactly true, is it? I mean, look at like the film industry, for example, which you know is worth. Yeah. Yeah, it does have become because it's more of like I think the soft tremendous. power conferred by it. Yeah, but it does have tremendous like economic value, right? For sure, and like Singapore, like at the moment, just doesn't have I guess the kind of uh, market that we can talk about or the even, fertility. Like, yeah, let's <laughs> 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 not use that word. But, uh, yeah, it doesn't like quite have I suppose the economic depth as opposed to. Uh, even like in the region, like maybe we look at say Hong Kong, which can uh, export its uh, say it has I guess sort of the talent base already in place to export its movies not just to mainland China but also to say English uh, speaking countries around the region. So that's something that like Singapore really lacks. Yeah, but I think uh, Jovan, what I'd like to ask is how um, theater has adapted to modern. Forms of technology, right? So I remember during the lockdown period, a lot of theater companies put up their plays on online platforms such as uh, Vimeo and YouTube for a limited time. So, do you think this is? Uh, I guess it's a bit of a loaded question, but do you think this is a model that can sustain itself, or like whether it can allow the theater industry to sustain itself? Mm. Firstly, I. Can't really comment on whether it's sustainable, uh, because I'm not sure about the economic costs involved when it comes to producing stage plays. So I'm not sure whether the the profits exceed the costs or whatnot. But what I can comment on is um, the advantages that it did bring about for me and for a lot of people as well during the circuit breaker period. Um, so firstly, the the most obvious advantage is that we get a lot more exposure to plays online because. Uh, we can just view them for free, and I think that's a really good way to just get more people involved in theater in general through this exposure. And secondly, I think that it's uh, one advantage when it comes to the economic side is also that it, by providing more exposure to theater companies, it also helps to well um, uh, increase their 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 target, increase their uh, scale of audience as well, mm. so appealing to a lot more Singaporeans across the the web, yeah. and yeah. maybe getting more um, audiences when it comes to actually staging these plays uh, in real life. Yeah, but I think it also, also opens up a lot more possibilities as well. So uh, Theatre Works is actually doing like these hybrid uh, plays, which involve both the actual stage and uh, a Zoom call. So I don't really know how they're going to do that, but I think that all the possibilities that have been opened up through uh, staging online plays or on Zoom calls is also very exciting as well. And I think that's something that maybe we could develop upon now because of this uh, pandemic. Yeah. I remember Mr. Ko once saying that uh, when the Singaporean government censors plays, right, they often censor the performance rather than the, the written form of the play, because they know that people most likely wouldn't read the play anyway. <laughs> so what do you think about this like intrinsic power that the performance has in viscerally impacting people whenever like a theatre performance is put up? Um, the key feature of theatre is its immediacy, um, as opposed to, let's say, film or poetry or prose the action is happening right in front of you. And I think as Mr. Ko has also said as well, it's a spectacle. So it's a lot more effective in um, evoking an emotional response from audiences. And in, in doing so, it also helps um, in evoking um, a call for change as well. And I think that's also very important as well, that this call for change reaches the minds of people and actually gets people to act upon it um, because theater or art in general doesn't drive change. It's people that drive change. So yes, uh, no matter how powerful the medium is, a more powerful medium does in, uh, may be more effective in uh, getting people to drive change, but ultimately it's the people themselves that drive change. 
But like, how do you think like media forms like theater and stuff can move towards like leaving more long-lasting impacts on people? Cause like, okay, let's say like, like I feel like a lot of people might have this problem where like you watch a movie like let's say a, a motivational movie, then you feel like super motivated for like one or two days, and after time you just forget about it. Like the like the effect that the movie leaves on you doesn't last for a long time, and because there's no sustained impact, right? Or follow up, you don't see the amount of change happening, and it's also like public mindset is very difficult to change in general. Like, <laughs> like your triple like your ge- your general Asian stereotype of become a doctor or an engineer has been here for who knows how long, and it doesn't seem like it's gonna go away anytime soon. So like, how do you think like we can use theater or any art form in general to leave first of all a more long lasting change, and then help to shift public mindset because of that? I mean, long lasting impact. Yeah. Um, mm, I think one key thing when it comes to changing mindsets is repetition. So repetition of a certain idea over and over again, or a certain uh, a story over and over again, and I think that can be achieved with theater, because uh, when we think about theater, we often think about a uh, theater being held in these like fancy, um, like fancy places like Victoria Theatre or the Wild Rice Theatre at Funan, right? But I think theatre can be held in more, uh, in much simpler ways, in much smaller scale uh, events as well. So there's stuff like agitprop theatre, invisible theatre, all these can happen uh, in public places with just a few people, a very small budget. And I think that if we as a community uh, just take part in these like micro, uh, micro performances all around the, all around Singapore, or at least uh, stage more of them, and provide Singaporeans more exposure to, to the, uh, narratives for social change that we want to invoke through theatre. Then I think it does go, uh, one step further towards encouraging change. But of course, it's not something that can be done overnight. I think it will take time. I think like also like expecting any art form to be able to by itself create change is probably an unreasonable expectation. I mean, it has happened before, but it's very it's a very rare thing. I think instead of seeing um, art itself as an agent for change, I think it's more helpful to think of it as a catalyst um, in the full like chemical sense, you know, in that it's not acting, it is more providing a pathway for something to happen by introducing different ideas, for example, into the public um, sphere of discussion. I think that's where, when, when, because art has this power to act as kind of a lens, you know, a magnifying glass to magnify issues that we may not usually talk about. Now, the magnification itself does not change things, but it helps push people to actually see what's behind the magnifying glass and to then want to change things and act on it. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, Tan Tan House, Fear of Writing, was uh, actually criticised the idea that we just go and watch plays and don't actually take action against the oppression or otherization that we observe. Because um, we, I don't know, it's just like watching a play is not the solution to any problem that we observe. Rather, it is um, the magnification, as just Simon said, or pointing a spotlight literally towards a problem that exists in society, but then it is just, uh, up to the audience on how they react and move on to take a step against the op- uh, oppression or otherization. Yeah, okay. I do want to say like this is if if you are for some reason interested in studying this, there is a it is an actual course. Uh, this is this course is called um, history and literature. It's offered by that I know of, it's offered by Oxford University because I've only ever looked at their website. But <laughs> what it says is like what it says is that. You guys know how, like, say, if you have a work of literature, right, it's a reflection of a historical time period, right? Because surely the author was inspired in some way by what happened during his lifetime or, like, by the politics that happened during his lifetime to write uh, this piece of literature. But also, uh, equally, right, like, um, like literature, I guess, it's a, bit, it's a bit strange to say that the influence flows the other way, right? That literature um, influences history. I guess it does, you know, it inspires people in some way to, to, to have a certain mindset, to take a certain action, but uh, where, yeah, it's just, it's like kind of the interplay, right, between, I, I suppose, these two sort of uh, historically considered separate uh, disciplines. Yeah. 
What other questions do we have on the list? Okay, I guess I'll just round this part of this question out because it was like, sort of different from our original purpose of doing this. But anyway, I think that was like really, it was a very interesting discussion. Now. Like, like I feel like most people, right? Like a lot of older people have this thing that like 17 year olds are like super immature and can't come with good ideas. I think that discussion <laughs> just proves them wrong flat out. I don't know it's very in depth, you know. But anyway, like going back to like becoming an independent creative director, what you want to call it, and like a content creator, I'll uh, just do the question about like, uh, about whether or not you feel like people not watching your play or like finding it lame or cringe because like I can, I can tell you that the, the, the image of like the Japanese like exchange students seeing the introduction like the intro part of my meme review is like burned into my brain <laughs> <laughs> so I can relate to that if anyone has watched the Ken meme review you'll know what I'm talking about so like Joe what do you feel about the fact that about like creating content that people may not want to watch or like may find lame or cringe yeah like, do you have that fear, you know? Yeah. I mean, because I wrote this question, and uh, I, well, I talked about this in the two episodes ago, I guess, of the podcast, but basically, like, I write um, articles and, or, like, and like video scripts as well, like, scripts for uh, esports videos, and I always have, like, sometimes you have new ideas, right? You want to you wanna write something new, something, like, you, you think is revolutionary, or you want to propose, something, like, it could, it, could not, it could be, like, outside of art, right? You want to propose something... Uh, some kind of initiative, right? And you always get that. I guess there is this fear at the back of your mind that, like, oh, people might not care, right? People uh, just don't want to show up, right? Do you, like, do you ever get that yourself? Um, yeah, it is a real fear. It's a perpetual struggle for me as well, especially when it comes to writing. Uh, so I'll speak from this. I'll speak of this from a writer's perspective. So, of course, when it comes to writing, uh, you read all these great works by by local and international authors, and you think to yourself, oh, I'll never match up to that. And I think the first step to dealing with it, or at least coping with it, is accepting the fact that uh, these people also have the same fears that you do. So uh, when I was in the, the playwriting course that I mentioned, uh, held by the necessary stage, so Haresh Sharma was actually uh, our instructor, so he taught us. And he also said that uh, even now, when he's writing a first draft for a new play, he still feels nervous. So just understand that everyone has this same fear, and it's not natural. Uh. And the second thing is that when it comes to writing a first draft, we'll always feel inadequate uh, when we write a first draft because we feel that, oh, I'll never match up to this writer, or I'll never match up to uh, that person, or my idol, or whatever. And that is also fine as well. Accept that, accept the fact that, accept the fact that a first draft's main point is just to exist, to just get your ideas out there and know that um, there's always time to edit and edit and edit and polish your draft until it becomes something that can really be published. So like Justinian mentioned, his, his really, really salient point about the creative tedium of just constantly reworking that draft. It's, uh, it's a really real thing in writing. So I, I, I saw like Ocean Vong's Instagram story. He said like he takes at least um, eight drafts before he publishes a poetry collection. So there's a lot of work that actually goes on behind the scenes. And I don't think any writer is actually um, that inherently talented when it comes to uh, producing whatever you see on their published works in the first draft. And the third thing to uh, to note when you feel this kind of fear is just to get a close circle of friends um, and just show them your works. Get your works read by others who can provide a second opinion. Get your works um, critiqued by others who have a fresh new perspective on your work. Because um, the thing when you're writing, right, is that you will feel that your work is not as good as you thought it to be because you've already seen it, but other people haven't seen it. So if you get fresh new perspectives on your work, maybe they'll complement it and maybe you feel more confident about um, whatever you're writing. Right? And yeah, I think the last part is just to accept the fact that it will be a perpetual struggle. You will have to destroy and rebuild your ego over and over again during the writing process. And it's something that you just have to deal with as a writer. So if you say that you're passionate about writing, right, just be prepared to deal with this. 
I think that's also a very important, like, if I may add, like, a fourth point, which is that, oh, no, that was actually, that, that was four already, like, a fifth, whatever point, right? <laughs> is this, like, idea that, like, today's cringe is, like, tomorrow's, like, <laughs> and today's art is tomorrow's cringe. Like, I, it's, it's a very, like, um, I think, real idea, because, like, if you look at a lot of, like, the reason, like, when we think things are cringe, right, usually it's because, like, it's kind of new and you're not used to the idea. I think, actually, historically, if you looked at, like, revolutionary pieces of art, most of them were not well received. Like, um, famously, right, Stravinsky's Bite of Spring, which was, like, really, um, yeah, revolutionary, right, musically speaking, caused a riot, right? I, but, like, 50 years later, it is, I don't know, it's, I mean, it's more than 50 years now, but, like, uh, like now it's, like, a century, I know, like, later, right? It's, uh, <laughs> Universal classic, yeah. So like, I think, and at the same time, things that used to be in vogue, we today pen because we have changed in our cultural kind of like um, perspective as well. So like, I think one thing that one should keep in mind is also that public opinion is not necessarily what one should be putting, you know, 100% of one's focus on. Like obviously listen to what the public is saying sometimes, right? Because sometimes people out there have valid perspectives, but like also realize that like the public perspective can sometimes be quite limited in the sense that they may not really understand what you're doing, but maybe after a while, they're going to get what it is, that kind of thing. Like in addition to all the things Jovan said, I think that's a really important realization that there is no final arbi like arbitration when it comes to the value of art. So like even if your thing is penned on the first try, maybe in like 10 years, it's going to be like a modern classic, you know? There's, there's always that like possibility and like um i think condition to like keep in mind yeah okay yeah i think it's applicable like i guess not just for uh not just for art but also like whatever initiative like i was like i mean this is the thing right like everything is cringe until it works you know what i'm saying like uh we always uh, yeah. yeah like people like you know like you even if like you say like council activities i guess <laughs> like people <laughs> they're, like almost universally like everything is cringe these days right but it, like you have one that works like it works really well people suddenly love it they forget like all of the negative things that they that they said early on and suddenly it's not cringe anymore right even though it's the exact same thing yeah so i see that my can be revealed has a chance it becomes a good one day. Yeah, <laughs> like, that's, I'm that's, that's like cursed rubbish. <laughs> okay. Maybe you should have revised it. Yeah, multiple drafts of yeah. your meme. <laughs> yeah, because like the thing is that if I showed it to anyone with half a brain cell, right? It, that the meme would, would have never been published on YouTube. <laughs> it would have never <laughs> left its mark on society. The important thing is that you tried, right? You did. You did some kind of content, right? Like at least you, at least you did something. You have something on your YouTube channel. Like how many people, like all the people, like panning it. It's just like, like what do they have to show, right? They, they've never tried anything, right? They've never done anything. So like, all the like all the power is with you. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like what you've done is infinitely more valuable than what they've not done at all. Yeah. yeah. This yeah. just makes me more motivated to make YouTube videos. Thank you, thank you. Very welcome. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, okay, that, that was a very good discussion. Okay, what, what else do you want to talk about? Like, I think like with the creative process, it's so like broad and expensive that there's so many different aspects to it. Like, there's YouTube videos now. There's even like crappy memes on Reddit can be counted as part of the creative process with just uh, less thinking involved. So like, I think like the beautiful thing about creativity is that you can make it apparent in anything you do in everyday life. Like, like I, I'm sure like you guys have seen like someone walking stranger on the road. But for them, that could just be a creative way of walking. You know what I mean? Like, like the like, like, city walk. As stupid as this sounds. <laughs> so I think like creativity and like our way to express things are so intertwined. And I think that's part of the reason why art is so important. Like, as like all of us were discussing at some point in this like long discussion, art is a form of human expression after all. And it can take place in various forms, ranging from crappy memes on Reddit to the best meme reviews on the internet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, but to be honest, right, if, like, something was, um, like, the idea of cringe, if something, anything that is cringe would obviously be against the norm, I would think. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to do something that is just normal and therefore not cringe, th I don't think there's very there's much value. value to you doing that action in the first place. Obviously, there's art that modifies upon things like remixes and stuff. <laughs> but if you're not going to do anything new or go against the grain, right? Like what is the value of that in the in the first place? And the cringe True. is also quite overused. 
like sometimes people use it as like a way of making themselves look better than the rest of you like like you see like like you know you like you see the average director saying oh anyone that plays fortnite is cringe but honestly they're just trying to make themselves look better is something else oh i don't play this game that's like overplayed or something or i don't listen to pop or oh, listening to taylor swift is so cringe for example it's just them trying to like make them make themselves feel better about their own music taste or about their own game selection whatever it is <laughs> so yeah also very true mm. yes does anyone have any final points, any final questions on us? Because if not, I think this is a good way to end off for today. Is there anything else for anyone? I agree. I don't have anything. Okay, Jim, oh, yeah. this so, is... Anyone who says that this podcast is cringe is exactly. uncool. Like, like, <laughs> if, if you think this podcast is cringe, why don't you make your own podcast? <laughs> okay, but anyway, since Joan has offered such amazing insights today, you are gonna you can have your hallmark... 30 seconds of fame and just like plug your own things if you want to so, like, just, just like give a final message to our viewers of this podcast uh, okay uh, first off uh, please go follow Playwrights Commune on Instagram we only have like I don't know 60 followers right now and yeah check out our posts and uh, other than that I guess um, please if you're listening to this please please make more effort to um, explore the local art community because um, I think other than developing a shared national identity, local art is important in developing our courage to follow your favourite uh, local artists especially because those because um, there's going to be so many opportunities that will pop up in this COVID circuit breaker period like online workshops or online poetry readings and whatnot. So now's your time to hustle. <laughs> Are we, are we going awesome. around? Are mm, Okay. So if you're still watching this video, be sure to smash the like button and subscribe to the channel and follow the podcast. I'll be leaving any, any like things that Joe wants me to leave in the description below, so be sure to like follow... Wait, are we, are we, all, are we all having concluding remarks or just... It's just, it's just him, man. Yeah, it's just me. I'm the big man. Okay. But anyway, yeah, be sure to follow Joe's like, playwright commune. And like, just like, if you want to ask him anything, uh, if he doesn't mind, I'll leave his Instagram handle down below so you can message him and have your yeah, own If you want to do about. something, just try it, bro. Just try it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just, just do, do it. it. Just do it. <laughs> okay, thank yeah. you all for watching. Have a good night and see you all in the next episode. I can't believe it's already episode 7. Anyways, good night. Bye-bye. Good night.